My area is mostly the public health part of automotive safety, and that is making sure all of the vehicle systems are compatible with real drivers. Uh, and foremost, in, in a customer's mind, when he brings a car in, is do, does the technician know the problem with it? Motoring 92 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. Have you ever taken your car in for service with a problem only to find out that it may take a couple of days for the mechanic to detect that problem? It can be frustrating, I know, but don't blame the mechanic. I mean, today's cars are more complicated than ever before, so it can take just a little longer to find out what's wrong with your car. But with the 90s has come new technology in troubleshooting. And this week, we're going to begin by meeting the mechanic's newest assistant. New state-of-the-art diagnostic equipment is becoming more common in garages across the country. It's aimed at countering two of the most frustrating service department headaches intermittent problems and hard to find problems. These are found in electronic engine controls and ignition and fuel systems that are difficult to pinpoint with conventional tools and methods. One of the most successful diagnostic machines is Ford's Service Bay Diagnostic System, better known as SBDS. Ford claims the SBDS has greatly reduced the amount of second visits. The result Customers are happy and so are dealers since the turnaround on vehicles he can service is faster. In order to see the system at work, Ford of Canada in Oakville agreed to create a defect with a Mercury Sable. Well Brad, what we're going to do is try to create a drivability concern which will cause a concern for the customer while he's driving the vehicle but which will not be apparent using the diagnostic equipment that the car has on board. Uh, through self-test or its ability to store memory codes. So this concern will create a drivability concern, uh, probably poor power, poor fuel economy and so forth. And uh, using SBDS we will determine the source of the problem um, using various tests on SBDS equipment. What I'm doing here is I'm isolating the hose that uh, the engine obtains air through. This is the air intake and the throttle body and the idle speed control solenoid. And between it and the mass airflow sensor, there's a hose. And if this hose is affected in some way or air is allowed to enter this tube, it affects the amount of air that is actually sensed by the microprocessor. And of course, the processor will make some adjustments based on the assumption that that sensor is accurate, which will not be the case. And this will result in some adjustments in the processor. Um, it will adjust the fuel injector pulse width, the spark advance, and uh, <coughs> perhaps even the lockup converter and several other outputs from the processor controlling drivability. The customer will feel a, probably a noticeable hesitation on acceleration, definitely a lack of power, and quite probably an engine ping as well. So it was off to the dealer, although it looked like our ailing vehicle might not make it out of the garage. There's a complaint in the work order stalling, hesitation, poor fuel economy. We run a star test. I haven't found any obvious problems with this vehicle. So I'm gonna hook this flight recorder up and go for a ride. We take four recordings. Then I'll come back and hook into the SBDS and see what I can find. The only hookup is in here is just to get some power to the flight recorder which is a very simple connection, just into the cigar lighter. Now I'm ready for a road test. I've been working in cars since 1964. That's when I got my license. Um, back then it was pretty simple. You could just look at, a, put a look at a car and you could fix it. And over the years they've become more and more complicated and now it's, um, it's a whole, whole new ball game now. Okay, we just done our third recording. We'll go back to the shop now and download our flight recorder into the SBDS and look at the results. The information from our road test is in this flight recorder here now. We'll have to download it and put it back into the SBDS and we can analyze it. The information is in the machine and I'll pick up what I look at. It's on the machine here. We'll go to the graph. I can see here the air trim 
has changed dramatically just after I pushed the button. And there's where the event happened. So there is a problem with the air fuel ratio. Before we had this machine, it was um, it was more of a hit and miss sort of thing. You'd get parts, plug them in, and see if that fixed it. You know, you go down, you get down the road, and, and um, you get sidetracked. You go on the wrong train for hours and hours trying to find something. Uh, this way, you can get to the get to the basic problem and and cure it. Usually one of the common complaints in vehicles like this is a lack of grab handles. Now when you're off-road, you need something to hang on and keep you in the seat, otherwise you might get tossed into the back there. Well in this vehicle there's no fewer than four grab handles for the front passenger to grab. There's one here, one here, and then two up here. In short, no danger when you're off-road. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive we go off-road as we take a look at this vehicle. This is the newest Isuzu Trooper. Now as you can see they've traded in that sort of upright really ugly boxy look for one that is rather contemporary and very attractive. Inside the new Trooper is very tastefully attired. The front captain style seats are large and comfortable ensuring the required level of support. In the rear, the seats provide bags of room for two adults, but three might find it a little tight on a long trip. The 60-40 split of the rear seat provides the usual level of versatility. Unlike most, these seats fold and tumble forward, meaning the length of the floor is not as long as it could be. Having said that, I doubt anyone will need more space. The driving position is exceptionally good in the Trooper. All the main controls are no more than a couple of inches from the steering wheel. This holds true for the power windows, lights, climate controls and the wonderful clarion radio. Some of the secondary controls like the rear wiper and defroster switches are buried rather low down in the dash. Now relocating them to the four vacant places in the center console would make much more sense. The dash is analog with all the gauges being easily viewed through the upper portion of the steering wheel. On the subject to the wheel it has a nice chunky feel giving the driver lots of grip ensuring that you can control the kickback when off-road. The Trooper brochure states that Isuzu have the right blend of Yang and Yin. Now I'm not sure what the heck these are, but anyway. Trading the very boxy Land Rover styling in for a clean modern look brings the Trooper in from left field, making it a lot more appealing to the mainstream buyer. One of the neat features with the Trooper is its trademark 70-30 split rear door. Splitting it in that manner allows this half to be light enough and not at all cumbersome. However, need to get a wide load in? Still, absolutely no problem. You simply just pop this door and now you have easy access to the entire width of the back end here. Under the hood of the Trooper sits a great new 3.2 litre quad cam 24 valve V6. Power is rated at 190 horses and 195 pounds feet of torque. The beauty of this engine is that it produces an abundance of torque at low RPM, coming fully on cam around 3500 RPM. Off-road this trait is extremely important. The four-speed automatic transmission matched with this engine works such that you can always derive the very best from the engine. By selecting the power mode, each gear is held a little longer, improving the pickup. The normal mode helps improve fuel economy. The nice feature of the transmission is the winter mode. When you select this mode, the transmission pulls away in third gear. Now this limits the amount of torque, which in turn limits the amount of wheel spin. Off-road, the combination of the four-wheel drive low and a good set of Bridgestone Dueler tires allows the Trooper to romp up some fairly steep grades without fear. The fully independent suspension is comprised of torsion bars up front and a multi-link coil spring set up in rear. On the road, the setup absorbs the larger road irregularities very well, but it has a tendency to jar the body over smaller bumps. However, the whole thing has the desired effect off-road. The system has enough travel built into it to cover just about any eventuality. Stopping power is provided by a four-wheel disc brake setup with ABS on the rear wheels only. 
Now there is an optional four-wheel ABS system available on the top of the line LS models. Stops are controlled and the pedal is easy to modulate. However, the nose dive at the limit is exaggerated because of the high seating position. My pet peeve on the Trooper is that despite having auto locking hubs, it does not have a shift on the fly capability. So if you head off road in two wheel drive, you've got to bring the vehicle to a standstill to shift into four wheel drive. In soft sand like this, that could mean you get stuck. Anyway, now to the scoreboard for a rundown on the newest Trooper. The new engine has power to spare and enough torque to pull the skin off a rice pudding. Important traits in any vehicle, but especially so in 4x4s. Acceleration is brisk, requiring 11 and a half seconds to eclipse the 100k mark. For the most part, the suspension has the desired effect. It absorbs the large bumps in stride and limits the amount of body roll in corners. Its stiff nature, however, transmits a lot of the small bumps, like expansion joints, directly to the occupants. The four-wheel disc provides strong fade-free stops time and again. The rear ABS ensures that the tail behaves itself if you jump on the brakes mid-corner. For the record, we required about 120 feet to stop from 80k. The Trooper gives you bags of room for four to travel in relative comfort. Wind noise is all but non-existent. Now there is some engine noise evident, especially under moderate to hard acceleration. During the test, we averaged 12.8 liters per 100 kilometers or 22 miles per gallon. Thirsty, but no more so than any other in this category. Best and worst figures were 27 miles per gallon and 17 miles per gallon, respectively. The new Trooper has the right stuff to make it a winner. It has power, comfort, and a surprisingly good highway ride. However, the lack of shift on the fly means they've missed the bullseye. We're back with mechanic Bill Stapleton. He has his Mercury Sable hooked up to the Service Bay Diagnostic System, the SBDS. Earlier, it showed you that it was either an airflow problem on this car or a fuel problem. What are you doing right now? We're hooking into the harness uh, to check the fuel flow. We eliminate one side of the problem anyway and then check the other. He will be back to hopefully see you solve the problem, but right now we're going to leave this garage and join our own mechanic, Bill Gardner, who would like to begin with a little trivia question this week. Okay, my trivia question for you is I want you to try and figure out the significance of this guy's personal license plate. I'll give you a hint. Think about your grade 9, grade 10 chemistry class. At the end of this segment, we'll tell you what it really means. But what we, what we really want to talk about this week is springs and suspension systems. We're going to look at four very different types of springs on two very distinctly different vehicles. Uh, right now, you're looking at the front end of a three-quarter ton Ford pickup truck, and you can see a steel coil spring in this corner of the vehicle. And keep in mind that it's the springs that regulate the ride height of the vehicle and establish the uh, load carrying capability of that vehicle. And in a lot of cases, people seem to think if they see their vehicle sitting low or uneven, that they've got a problem with their shock absorbers. In most cases, shock absorbers just stop these springs from bouncing the vehicle all over the place when you hit a series of bumps. There is the exception of air type or air assisted shocks that do regulate a little bit of the ride height, but in most cases it's the spring that establishes the load carrying and ride height of that vehicle. So let's move to the rear of this vehicle and have a look at the steel multi-leaf rear spring in the back of this vehicle. Okay, here's the rear suspension of this pickup truck and you can see a multi-leaf steel leaf spring in the back of this truck and this is an ideal type of a spring for a, a truck, a van, or any vehicle that's carrying a lot of cargo because it's a very strong setup. It also tends to be a little bit on the harsh side though and give a stiff ride. And one of the things they've done to combat that in the last few years is add these nylon inserts at the tips of the leaves. Now when these leaves uh, work on each other as the spring moves up and down, they try and move back and forth. There's some inner leaf friction like this and that tends to make the spring a little bit harsh on on small bumps. So they've added these nylon inserts to make it slide a little bit easier. The other thing that afflicts this design is rust and corrosion and you can see quite a bit of it on this one right here. And eventually that will fatigue the spring somewhat, and make it sag down and our vehicle will sit a little bit lower, won't be able to carry quite as much weight. Now you can see the arc to this spring. Right now there's no weight on this spring and you can see quite a distinct arc to it. And at the rear of the spring we've got the shackle assembly here with a pivot here and here. Now as the weight comes on this spring and pushes it up and in, this end of the spring has to, has to move back. The spring flattens out and actually gets a little bit longer. So our shackle will pivot back something like this and when we take the weight off it will move back to this relaxed position. 
Now, one thing that you want to keep in mind with springs when you're ordering a vehicle, don't send a boy on a man's job. If you're ordering a pickup truck or a van, make sure that your springs are tailored to the cargo you're apt to carry in that vehicle. Next week, we want to show you an all-wheel drive minivan with radically different springs at both ends of that vehicle. I'm sure a lot of you will be really surprised by what I'm going to show you there. And getting back to our trivia question, this guy with the pickup truck's in the swimming pool chlorine business, and NAOCL happens to be the chemical symbol for chlorine. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 92. The latest high concept car from General Motors is the ultralight four passenger sedan. It weighs 1,400 pounds, goes from zero to 100 kilometers in less than eight seconds, and covers about 115 highway miles on a gallon of gas. It's light and fast because GM used carbon fiber for the body and structure. Carbon fiber is too expensive for public use today, but concept vehicles such as the ultralight could bring the cost down. We have modified our family of test dummies with a frangible insert and what this is designed to do is to mimic how the lower body would react if the belt were to load. And here's an example of uh, a lap belt that we caused the submarine into the abdomen. You can see the trace of the force of the belt digging in. What's ailing this mercury sable? Well, mechanic Bill Stapleton and his service bay diagnostic system will soon let us know. But first, if you remember on last week's program, we found a very perplexed Jim Kenzie on Kenzie's Corner. You see, Jim couldn't figure out why car manufacturers were unable to build cars as safe as race cars in accident situations. Well, as we're about to see, it certainly isn't from a lack of trying. Uh, the other thing that we do when we do our testing with Mick is that we take the whole family for a ride. And it's very important because uh, some uh, would emphasize testing the safety of a mid-sized male test dummy. Our programs require that from the full uh, large occupant down to the small child, that anybody who can sit in a particular seating position be buckled up and be tested for their safety. Just a General Motors recently held news conferences in Montreal and Toronto. The subject, car safety. General Motors had some of their leading safety research people on hand to remind the media of GM's ongoing commitment to building safer cars. Well, we've been keeping track of the uh, safety record of cars for the last 50 years, and, and each decade we've had a significant reduction in uh, fatalities and serious injuries. I think we're down by a factor of seven from the 1930s and, and well over a factor of three from the 1960s. And this is uh, related to improved vehicles, highway systems, and better drivers. In our crash testing program, we do a number of different uh, crashes that are real relevant to the kind of experiences that drivers have. Uh, these could be frontal crashes, side impacts, rear impacts, and rollovers. Let's get some things on the ground. The first uh, test sequence was a 1929 Chevrolet that was uh, crash tested in the late 1960s to show how we didn't uh, make them uh, crash worthy in the early days. And uh, it was uh, essentially the vintage vehicle that was a wood frame with a sheet metal on the coverings. And it demonstrated two important uh, principles of vehicles today, and that is the uh, energy absorption by the crushing of the vehicle structures that uh, control the stop of the vehicle, and then the passenger car integrity, which is it's almost like a race car space frame around uh, the passengers in our vehicles. And this uh, is very sturdy so that after a crash of the kind you saw, the doors can be opened and uh, there's very little distortion of that cocoon around the passengers. Uh, so that's the second part of the overall strategy. Uh, the third is to, to uh, have the lap shoulder belts provide restraining loads on the occupant during the controlled crush of the, crush of the front end. This lowers the crash forces and, and makes uh, less risk of injury. The, the data really shows that the overriding controller of the vehicle safety is the driver. Um, we continue to work with drivers on uh, making them aware of the safety features in the vehicle, but also to let them know that it's their driving behavior that's really a, a very important in the overall safety of not only them, but their passengers. One subject that was not raised at the news conference was the fact that General Motors has come under attack for using live animals in their safety research. 
Well, we have a broad-based program that uh, tries to advance the safety of, of humans uh, in vehicle use and in crashes. And we've done a very limited amount of research using animals to try and make sure that the test dummies and the mathematical models are, are most effective at predicting the uh, protective functions of the safety systems. And we have been uh, declining the use of that over the years, and we will only do it when it's necessary that, that the human health is uh, the important thing to be considered. I don't oversimplify it, but is the bottom line that you are still safer in a bigger car than a smaller car in the 90s? Um, one of the most significant uh, attributes of a vehicle safety is its weight. Uh, and uh, that is just a fact of physical laws, and that bigger cars are safer than smaller cars. However, all vehicles that we uh, put on the road have a high degree of safety, and every new vehicle model is safer than the one it replaces. So we have a, a strategy of incremental improvement, but when I tell my mom what kind of a car she should buy and drive, I always pick the biggest one for her. What kind of car do you drive? <laughs> well, I rotate in the vehicle fleet, and I'm now driving a, a Buick, uh, but I put my mom in a big Cadillac. There's a lot of cars to choose from out there. But what car company builds the safest cars? Well, the answer might surprise you. I'll be back in a moment. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Now, I've not always been totally in love with General Motors vehicles, but you've got to give GM credit where credit is due. Since 1967, they've been conducting research into real-world crashes involving their vehicles to ensure that the safety stuff they build into these things doesn't work only in the lab. GM has also shown that surviving on our roads is more than just seat belts and airbags. They've found that you're more likely to be benefited by accident avoidance features by a factor of 100 to 1 compared to accident protection features. For example, something like an airbag, which is an accident protection feature, is likely to be used on average once every 176 years. But you're likely to use an accident avoidance feature like anti-lock brakes about once a month. Just bet where my money's going to be spent. But the most important crash avoidance feature is still the driver. And GM can even take some credit here because much of the curriculum for advanced driver training programs conducted around the world was developed by Doc Whitworth at GM's Proving Grounds in Milford, Michigan. So GM, Ford, Volvo, and all the other car companies have spent millions of dollars and thousands of hours of research making sure your car is as safe as it possibly can be. But the final responsibility still rests with you. So get some training, don't drink and drive, use that safety belt, and leave your aggression on the squash court. This way you'll survive long enough to join me next week on Kenzie's Corner. I'm Jim Kenzie. We're back at the Thorncrest Sherway Ford dealership in Toronto. With me again is mechanic Bill Stapleton and his best friend, the SPDS Diagnostic Computer. Earlier, uh, this computer told you that the problem with this Mercury Sable is either fuel or airflow. What have you figured out in the last 45 minutes? Well, we've run the, the fuel flow test, and we can see that each, each injector was in within 2% of, of perfect. So I suggest the fuel system is all right. It must be in the airflow system. And we've solved that problem? And we have found the problem, yes. How much time and how much money do you think you've saved yourself and the customer? Oh, we could have saved hundreds of dollars if, it, like, it's a very small hole in the, in the uh, air intake tube. It'd be very difficult to find. It's a lot easier now than it was back in 1964 oh, when you got your 64. license? 64, oh, is it ever? Yes, that's right. right. Bill Stapleton, thanks for your patience. You're and welcome. thank you for watching, and we will see you once again next week for more stories about cars and the people who fix them and drive them. Motoring 92 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil.